Hello, and welcome to the Talking Precision Medicine podcast. In this series, we sit down with experts on the application of AI and big data analytics in the drug discovery space. Our guests are innovators, business decision makers, and thought leaders at the intersection of data and therapeutics. We discuss the promise, practice, challenges, and myths of AI and precision medicine. This show is brought to you by Genialis, and Raphael, its CEO, is your host. Genialis is focused on data integration and predictive modeling of disease biology to help accelerate the discovery and de-risk the development of novel therapeutics. Our guests for this episode of Talking Precision Medicine are Elisa Prishup and Cameron Fox of the World Economic Forum. Elisa and Cameron take us through the WEF's Precision Medicine Initiative and explain how anticipating ethical tensions is key to envisioning policies for precision medicine across the globe. This and so much more. Let's get right to it. Thank you all for joining me today. Today we have two really fascinating guests from the World Economic Forum, Alyssa Pritchup and Cameron Fox. Um, I'm gonna ask you, Alyssa and Cameron, to introduce yourselves uh, a little bit about your own background and what you do at the World Economic Forum. Sure, I'll start off. Uh, my name is Alyssa Pritchup. I joined the World Economic Forum about two and a half years ago. Um, and a, a little bit about how I got here. I started my career actually in economic development, policy and legislation for the state of Maryland. And I was really heavily focused on healthcare topics there. Then I went to business school. I was a Woodruff Fellow at Emory University and then headed over to Merck um, or MSD, where I focused a lot on the business side of um, launching new products. So I worked on a variety of products from ophthalmology to women's health and, and eventually Keytruda um, at the start of that in immuno-oncology and, and biosimilars as well. And toward the end of my time at Merck, I really wanted to go back a bit into the policy space and focus on the, the need to bring patients um, further into conversations, really give them a seat at the table, especially when it comes to precision medicine where their involvement is, is really critical, I, I believe, in the advancement of precision medicine in an ethical way. So I, I was lucky enough at the time that the forum uh, had just opened the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution and posted a role on precision medicine, and that's what brought me here. So since I've been here, I've been working on mostly leapfrogging with precision medicine, which I know I'll talk more about shortly. Over to Cameron. Yep. Good to meet you, Raphael. So my name is Cameron Fox. I have actually been at the forum for exactly a year as of today. I just realized that. That's wonderful. My background is in neuroscience and philosophy, and I originally had planned on going into a PhD program in neuroscience, but I started to lean more towards the policy realm and wanted to have a broader impact than you can have in the lab, which is no disrespect to lab work <laughs> at all. And so I did a graduate program at Duke in bioethics and science policy. And that was what led me into the role that I currently have as a specialist on the precision medicine team. So in that role, I support several projects. I lead a couple myself that mostly involve mental health. And aside from that on the day-to-day, -day, um, whatever else is needed on the team, a lot of research, a lot of project support. Wonderful. Well, thank you both again for, for joining us. At risk of already getting off schedule, uh, Alyssa, you said something that, that jumped out at me. Um, you, you mentioned the fourth industrial revolution. So I want to know what that is, but let me couch it in the question that is kind of on the agenda, which is, I was surprised to learn that the World Economic Forum has a precision medicine initiative, nevertheless, a major thrust with serious policy pieces and, you know, organizational um, mandates around that. So maybe could you tell us what, what the WF defines as the fourth industrial revolution, but then more generally, what, what is its mandate around precision medicine? Where does that fit? Yeah, great question. So the World Economic Forum, I think for most people, they've heard of it in connection with the annual meeting that the forum runs in Davos, Switzerland every year. But the forum is actually a 50-year-old nonprofit committed to improving the state of the world. And we have numerous different platforms and projects across the forum where essentially what the forum seeks to do is create multi-stakeholder collaborations, bringing together people from business, from government, from academia, from civil society, and, and 
other spaces to come together to think about and, and work on solving some of the world's greatest and long-term problems, things that, that any organization on its own wouldn't be able to address. So within that, one of the platform projects is shaping the future of, of health and healthcare. And I can, I can talk about that in a moment, but to back up about three years ago, the center launch, or I'm sorry, the forum launched the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And the idea behind the, the Fourth Industrial Revolution is it is the blurring, essentially, of physical, digital, and biological, raising issues of not just how we interact with the world, but how um, we interact with and, and change even ourselves and the impacts of that on society. So because the space is moving so quickly, what we are, are looking to do most of the time is think about how to ensure that these technologies, the trajectory of them is shaped for, for good. And some of that is through looking at gaps and, and new approaches to policy and governance and, and um, frameworks and other, other processes and tools. Got it. So just to, to kind of say back what I'm hearing, in, in addition to sort of maybe the obvious large umbrella of healthcare as a way to make the world better and to maybe improve access and improve you know, outcomes and so forth, the fourth, the fourth Industrial Revolution is focused even more specifically on, say, genomic medicine or the way that kind of our ability to generate huge amounts of data and how our identities are tied to that is, is distributed. Is that getting at the thrust of it? Yeah, that's that's one aspect of it. We have a number of different platform projects at the mm -hmm. C4IR. So just to name a few, artificial intelligence and machine learning is one which involves drones and, and aerospace and robotics mm -hmm. is another. Blockchain, certainly, and mm -hmm. digital currency is another. So there, there are a number of different platform projects at the C4IR and, and precision medicine was one of them as, as well. We'll be sure to, to include links on the episode page though so people can can check out the platforms themselves so precision medicine then let, let's dive into that since that's you know nominally the um, topic of this podcast series talking precision medicine <laughs> tell me a little bit about how the wf tackles that and maybe you two specifically sort of what is your work purview what are some of the work products you've generated and, and how do you see kind of engaging in that community yeah maybe i'll i'll lead in and, and kevin and i can go back and forth a little bit so to start, I mentioned the platform for shaping the future of, of health and healthcare. And the mission of the platform is really to ensure that every person on this planet has access to the highest standards of health and healthcare available to them by 2050. And we're looking at that through multiple projects that span keeping populations healthy, which is making sure that we can maintain health as long as possible. But once people need healthcare, the other area we're focused on is transforming healthcare delivery systems. And precision medicine really falls into that bucket. And there are a number of, of projects within that. Just to, to start, um, the way we think about precision medicine at the forum is a more precise and targeted way of screening, diagnosing, treating, sometimes even curing people of disease based on a deeper understanding of their own genetic and biologic makeup. And you know, more data points are going to be added to this over time, environmental, certainly. Um, and this, this rise in precision medicine has really been brought about by the technological advancements we were touching on before with, with the, the 4IR, um, AI and machine learning in particular. But I, I feel like I've been talking a lot, so I want to bring Cameron back in, and uh, maybe Cameron, you can talk about some of the, the projects. Sure. So one way that I originally discovered the forum was while I was in grad school, my advisor was doing quite a bit of work with them. And I was looking into some of the ethics and legal implications of genomic data. And so this is something that's very pertinent to the work that the forum does. And last summer and through much of this year, Alyssa and I worked on a project called Leapfrogging with Genomic Medicine. I think it's a good example of what our platform does, where we try to understand this space, which in many ways is still undefined. You know, genomic data is quite different from other types of data, and it's not quite clear how you regulate that, how you think about these ethical implications, who should be in charge of this data, what does consent look like, et cetera. 
And so we want to try and fill in some of those gaps to look five to 10 years in the future and understand where are we not thinking hard enough? Where are some blind spots that might be deleterious to us down the road? And how do we address those prophylactically so that they don't you know, bite us before we fix them? So that's how I at least got into this space and why I was mm-hmm. originally interested. No, I, I think that's fascinating. I mean, you know, I imagine the challenges kind of come at this from different angles. One is simply access, right? So a problem that, that I encounter a lot is a lot of the massive databases and data sources that practitioners have to try to discover new medicines and therapeutic interventions are heavily skewed towards Northern European populations. And some Northern European countries have done wonderful jobs curating these data, and, and I applaud them for it. But I think there's a real representation issue, certainly if you look at global demographics. But then you, you want better representation, but you want it to be done in an ethical way. So how do you think about tackling representation without maybe putting impediments in place? You know, you, you want to facilitate it, but you also want it to be done right. So, so is that actually intention or is that, is that an opportunity? I think that it is intention, but I don't think that means that it's not a point of opportunity. You know, this is jumping a little bit ahead in the conversation, but when we were trying to think through these ethical quandaries, we wanted to be really cognizant of where we come from and the fact that we can't possibly represent, you know, different cultures, different uh, ways of viewing the world. And so we don't ever want to be prescriptive with what is or isn't ethical. We don't want to be, you know, telling people from on high. And so instead we tried to create a series of what we call ethical tensions, which just made people aware of what some of the pitfalls could be if you lean too far in any direction along six axes that we identified. And we think that that gives leeway for different perspectives to just understand where others are coming from without us ever saying what must be done. And one example of that, to to your point, Raphael, is this idea of inclusion versus exclusion. There have been a lot of quixotic and maybe too gung-ho attempts by Western scientists to include people from other cultures that were done in an insensitive, done in a callous way, and it ended up hurting everyone. Uh, one example of that would be the the way that the Havasupai tribe in Arizona was treated in the late 80s, where they had pretty high rates of diabetes and wanted to understand why. So they worked with researchers at Arizona State to you know, give them blood samples. You know, They thought they had a good relationship. And these scientists kind of pulled the rug out from under them and ended up publishing a paper that talked about, you know, what they called an inbreeding coefficient. You know, they talked about their higher risk for alcoholism and schizophrenia, talked about where they come from in an anthropological sense, in a way that clashed with their cultural values, where they consider themselves the guardians and stewards of these canyons. And they've been there since they were put there. And now most of the tribes in the Southwest still won't work with researchers. And, you know, that's, that's reasonable on their part. And so, These are really, really tough questions and balancing inclusion and exclusion in a culturally sensitive way is not an easy task by any means. I think a lot of what we do and and maybe what's appropriate at this time is is raising questions. How we started to approach this space was the recognition that as precision medicine advances, it has the opportunity to bring a lot of good to the world, but if not addressed correctly, it also has the opportunity to really increase drastically healthcare disparities across the world. And we wanted to work to make sure that precision medicine advances in a way that is socially um, beneficial Mm -hmm. across across the globe. So one of the the areas we started to focus on was this, this area of genomic data policy and ethics. And we got there just from hearing from a number of researchers, business leaders, government officials from around the world, this needs attention right now. That makes a lot of sense. What I was gonna ask um, of you, Alyssa, is if you could maybe dive in a bit where Cameron left off. You said that you've kind Mm -hmm. of detailed a series of ethical tensions. Maybe you could even enumerate a couple of these. Like, how do you articulate a tension? You know, I appreciate the, the example of, you know, maybe a controversial use of data, 
But I, I definitely want to also focus on best practices and where we see some of those in the real world already. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I may back up a step and, and give a little bit more context. Sure, please. Um, so some of what we were recognizing, and I think you know, you got to this in, in your question earlier, is the majority of data does currently exist on Caucasian populations. I think it's 72% of existing data. So the world has recognized this, and we've started to see an increase in the interest in collecting data from populations traditionally underrepresented. Additionally, in emerging economies, there's also um, the fastest growth in disease burden, new healthcare markets. So there does seem to be an increase in the interest in collecting and using data from, again, populations traditionally underrepresented. The issue that we recognize with that is when there's a lack of policy governing how that data is collected and used, it leaves the opportunity for bad actors to come in and take that information, extract it, use it for their own benefit. And as Cameron correctly pointed out, we've seen examples of this happening in the past, in in the recent past, and the response can be swift. It can be that communities just quickly shut down access to research. And not only will this kind of restrictive policy then negatively affect global collaboration, it will further kind of create disparities where that population that traditionally hadn't been included is now also blocked from being included because of the bad actions purposefully or or by mistake of those trying to, to pull data. So that's how we got into this space of genomic data policy and ethics. And we really wanted to, you know, again, present questions that, as well as policy principles, that will really help guide government leaders, business leaders, civil society, patient populations to work together and and craft approaches that foster research and discovery and innovation and workforce development and eventually diagnostics and treatments more appropriate to a population. How we, how we got heavily into the ethics space and, and made a really purposeful decision to tie it to the policy space is that policy should be a reflection of the ethics within a society. Otherwise, that policy risks not living up to um, its, its purpose and potentially mm-hmm. even causing conflicts within society. So yeah, after, and we can talk about all of the, the research and consultations we did, but after, after a lot of them and, and hours and hours at the whiteboard, mm-hmm. <laughs> we got down to, to six ethical tensions. Um, Cameron, do you want to talk more about some of the other ones we, we identified and, and some of the, the overarching issues around power dynamics with that as well? Yep, absolutely. So as Alyssa spoke to, we pretty early on realized that ethics has to be an intrinsic component of any policy prescription that we're going to put out. And through a lot of research, a lot of interviews that culminated in a workshop we had with several academics that were represented, a lot of different parts of society, we were able to come up with six of these ethical tensions. So the first one that we have is balancing individual privacy with societal benefits. This is Mm -hmm. One that, you know, is obviously not just pertinent to genomic data, but that you can see Mm -hmm. in political philosophy going all the way back, really. The second And currently in in COVID and some of the... Sure. Indeed, yeah. Just just about wherever you look, yeah. Yes. (laughs) Uh, Second, we have balancing open and restricted data access. This is more apropos to genomic data than a lot of other parts of society. And this is just considering who has access to data that exists and Mm -hmm. what are some of the pros and cons of having something be more open access? Do you Mm -hmm. risk having bad actors come in if it's too open? Do you risk having people that don't have enough resources shut out if you you restrict these silos? What's the balance there? Number three is looking at balancing receiving benefits and altruistic donations. So there have been questions about benefit sharing For several decades in the pharmaceutical industry, especially once clinical trials started to mostly be carried out in low and middle income countries. But these these questions become even more difficult when you think about genomic data. You know, if if a a large personal commercial genomics provider were to... (laughs) Sure, sure. sure. Were to ask you to donate your data, Mm -hmm. well, you know, 
if you're a consumer living in the United States, then you probably feel quite altruistic and that feels okay. It feels a little more egregious if, you know, a company goes into, say, Rwanda and collects a lot of data on folks' genomics and then says, well, we're going to use this for our research purposes for the benefit mm-hmm. of all. Well, that, that feels a little right. more disingenuous. And so there, there are certainly questions there. Mm-hmm. Number four is balancing community and researcher oversight. You know, uh, since uh, at least the Belmont report, we've seen a a rise in uh, IRBs, institutional review boards, and other ethical bodies. But one criticism of them over the years has been that they don't bring in communities enough, and it generally tends to be populated with, you know, scientists that Mm -hmm. have their own motives. So there's a bigger move towards community-based participatory research in a lot of sectors now, including in genomics. So that's a good thing. But of course, on some level, you have to have scientific oversight at the same time. Mm -hmm. So balancing those two is an issue. Five is the one we spoke to earlier with inclusion and exclusion. One that we had a really hard time articulating and figuring out what we meant. But I think the example I gave with the Hepasupai earlier is a good way to Mm -hmm. frame what can happen. Mm -hmm. Lastly, we have a tension over confidentiality versus duty to inform. Now, this is an interesting one in genomics because, of course, unlike most types of data, your genomic data isn't only pertinent to you, it's pertinent to anyone you're related to. This leads to complicated issues. Um, The most, the example I'd bring up would be these twin lawsuits that are going on right now or might have recently finished in Britain and Germany, where in one case, a woman is suing the National Health Service in England because she was not informed by her father's doctor that he had Huntington's, which is, you know, a Mm -hmm. devastating and terminal genetic disease that you have a 50% chance of having. She was pregnant and did not know that her father had it. Her father's doctor knew and didn't tell her. Perhaps she had a, had a right to know that. And in Germany, you see exactly the opposite situation where a woman was informed by her doctor that she possibly had Huntington's. It caused her to lose her job due to a depression she developed, and she's suing because she did not want to know that information. Mm-hmm. These are incredibly tough issues, and yeah. there's no easy answer. But this is why we articulate them as tensions and not as prescriptions for how you should think about these problems. Yeah, and they really need to be um, adapted to to fit in with the current laws, the current approaches, and and the um, norms within a society across different countries. So they are meant to be really thought through um, and and applied. I actually had a a phone call with somebody this morning um, out of the blue who's working on genomic research related to COVID patients, and Mm -hmm. she said that there's kind of an, an absence of ethical approaches to help um, gain approval for the, the platform she's building. And she's been using the questions that we put out in our work and asking them of participants just to you know, understand how to create a, a more inclusive approach to the collection mm-hmm. of data and, and build <clears throat> on existing um, ethical kind of standards, which is great to hear. No, that, that must be both satisfying, but it's also illuminating to kind of understand the practical utility of, you know, this sort of work. Now, there are two major areas that I want to dive into, and we could go to either way, either way first. I'm, I completely agree that tying policy to ethics is really important. And I would actually, maybe a third place is tying, I want to go is, I want to go into policy, I'd like to talk about incentives as well. Incentives are kind of the flip side of policy, right? Policy and regulatory says, this is what you can and can't do. Incentives, you know, is kind of the flip side of that which should also be ethics. But I also want to get into patient advocacy and and patient engagement. Mm. I suspect the answer to all of these is what you alluded to earlier, which is it's going to be a multi-stakeholder approach. But maybe we can start with policy. How do you think about putting teeth on policies and regulatory concerns? Is it it always going to be nation by nation? Might it be regional? Might it be self-governance of industries? Like, Where do we start with, with actually implementing policy and regulation? That's a great question. Um, And I think we've seen different approaches work effectively. Um, 
you know, sometimes the government leads by by necessity. Sometimes it's international organizations that that lead by necessity. And GDPR and the the policy put out on data privacy in the EU was was certainly an attempt by numerous governments to really set forth a, a strong approach to data privacy and, and individual protection. However, sometimes we see companies taking the first step. And I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see if that is the way things move forward, for example, in benefit sharing. Right now, there is really the need to kind of look at how to develop more innovative approaches to benefit sharing, building off of current models that, that exist and building off of the Nagoya Protocol. And I think there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to this. There are a lot of things that need to be considered in terms of what is the benefit that is best to be shared. Is it monetary? Is it not monetary? At what points in a process should it be distributed? To whom should it be distributed? And at what level? And I think these are going to be things that, while, while models may exist, are probably better negotiated between institutions and, and communities. So I think with that, we'll start mm-hmm. to see more, more come about through um, a grassroots approach or, again, a, a business consortium approach international organization approach, maybe. It's actually something that, that I would like to start looking at as a continuation of this work is how can we bring a number of leaders together to just start talking about what are new things that are um, appropriate mm-hmm. in this space and how can we be really creative in thinking about the need for just collection of genomic data and also building communities as, as that data collection happens. I agree with you. And it... <laughs> It's messy, like all of this. Mm-hmm. It's not clear at what level these things should be applied. You know, one, one thing that comes to mind, thinking about at what level these things are necessary, on the one hand, we want more international data consortiums. We want mm-hmm. to not have this be so dominated by Northern European data sets. Mm-hmm. But there are questions of how international you go and who gets to decide. You know, I think about when the WHO was eradicating smallpox and they would break down people's doors and forcefully inject them. And it's, it's great that we did that <laughs> and eradicated smallpox, but not, sorry, let me rephrase that. Not at all great the way that that happened. <laughs> Excuse my phrasing. Um, well, can, I, can, I, can I interrupt and, and just ask, is the World Health Organization actually pronounced the WHO like the band? It is. <laughs> That's amazing. I did not know that. <laughs> it's, it's really great. It's, it really says something about the power of the band that um, <laughs> even in the sector that I work in, I think that the band comes to mind at least as often as the organization when someone says the who. But I think that is what most people say. Yeah. So I feel like when the, dust, the COVID dust settles, that's an organization that's going to need to do some sort of rebrand building, you know, and, and they've got some opportunities here. Anyway, yeah, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> No, but, uh, but I think your point's taken. There are some, you know, there's some really interesting examples of companies and agencies and organizations that I'm aware of, and probably many more I'm not, that are kind of pioneering approaches to this more from the incentive side, maybe than the policy side. And I'm thinking of like mm-hmm. Luna DNA based out of San Diego, which has kind of a, a both a profit sharing, but also, also a very kind of, you know, kind of heavily patient oriented consent mechanism. And they've, of mm-hmm. course, partnered with, with Sharon Terry's group, the Genetic Alliance. You know, which mm-hmm. is really at the forefront of this. Um, but it's the global reach that, that makes me sort of pause, right? Like it's, it's Absolutely. all well and good to be based in San Diego. And, and, and the question is, how do you then, <laughs> but then how do you reach folks who, who you know, aren't tapped into kind of genomics capital of the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the shift of the space to a really data oriented space, it's raising so many new questions because it's much easier to, capture and and zip off information to different parts of the world, does that bring into question prior kind of benefit sharing agreements? Mm -hmm. Because now, you know, there's maybe less cost, there's less travel, but at the same time, it's it's not a one-time interaction when you have data. That is is shareable and replicable in perpetuity. So does this increase the value? Does it decrease the value? How how are people supposed to think about this? And when it comes to models like Luna, I think it's fascinating and and kudos to companies that are are trying innovative approaches. I I can't wait to see how it continues to develop. It does 
again, really raise, raise questions about, is it right to have that kind of benefit shared at the individual level? Or does that start to maybe move down a scary path of Mm -hmm. valuing people's genetic information differently than other people's? And could that even create some kind of like genomic tourism? Now we're maybe going into like (laughs) dark future sci-fi territory, but you know, maybe, maybe not. Could it heavily influence research and where research dollars go? On top of that, like this whole idea of um, how to value genomic data, particularly with, I think, emerging economies and considering the historical context of, of how resources have been just stripped from many of those countries, if you look at genomic data as a resource, what, again, does, does that mean for, for these countries and you know, how, how it's valued, how it's shared, how open or restricted that data access should be? And then, and then you can easily kind of <coughs> shift that over into the, the altruism space Cameron was mm-hmm. mentioning before. Is it when are these um, approaches kind of taking away altruism and social norms versus when are they, you know, encouraging more mm-hmm. um, activity? So it gets very, very complex very, very quickly. And I'm glad you brought it up. And again, I'm glad companies are starting to, to think mm-hmm. about how to approach this. You know, we're going to end up seeing a lot of models. There are, of course, other organizations. The one that comes to mind is H3 Africa, but I'm sure there are others as mm-hmm. well, where they're the, the kind of MO is to build the organization around practitioners who represent the, the region and the geographies and the demographics and the communities that are contributing their data, right? So it's, it's really mm-hmm. trying to have, I guess, a lot of both empathy, but also, you know, deep-rooted connections between the organization and, and the people it's serving. Yeah, that was interesting. When we were starting starting this work and starting to research it, we, we really wanted to take a forward-looking perspective. Not mm-hmm. that we can predict the future as, as much as we wish we could. Um, we started to think about, like, what, what are reasonable guesses as to where genomic data policy will be in five to ten years, and what are mm-hmm. the, um, the likely conflicts that will come of it? So we created these four different you know, scenarios you know, one around uh, around patient consent, one around data privacy, one around data access, and one around benefit sharing. And we've been surprised to find that they weren't they weren't five to ten years out. They seem to have been three to six months out, as we've been watching wow, the news. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, this this benefit sharing conflict was was definitely one that is taking shape quickly. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little more about that. What were some of your predictions around consent, privacy, access, and benefits? You know, w- what's already coming true that you thought might have been a half decade or a decade off? And anecdotes are fine here too. It doesn't have to be comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say these are all these are all online. These are all online. Are if people want great. to, as, as we start yeah. talking about, yeah, resources that are are available. Oh, I think, oh, I think it was all of them. <laughs> I think one was about um, significantly dropping the cost of genomic data sequencing mm-hmm. to a price point that makes it incredibly accessible. And like Cameron, correct me if I'm, I'm blurring some of these vignettes together, but in light of that, a major genomic sequencing company in the West um, mm-hmm. partnered with a government in Africa. The government in Africa wanted, and again, this is all made up. This is totally right. made up. <laughs> But the, the government wanted to take a um, ambitious approach to improving healthcare and develop a partnership where they could sequence babies at birth. Mm-hmm. And the price point made this possible, the collaboration made it possible, but where it started to hit conflict is in the, the consent approach. And you know, who can really consent? Do these consents need to be broad or narrow? informed um at what point does it wear off because the baby that's been sequenced is is 18 and shortly thereafter we did see some in the news projects that were looking at sequencing babies in africa related to sickle cell disease yeah which again could have incredible benefits for those those children but it does raise all these questions about where does that data go and who owns it and how is it consented and how's it going to be used? And does it leave the country's borders? And so, but these, these are detailed in, in the white paper that you've 
put out. Am I, am I right about that? This is at least part, these vignettes are part of the, the content of that, correct? We, we do. We put them out. They're actually, they're on mm -hmm. our website. Um, it, the attendees at the, the first workshop where we were really trying to get mm -hmm. into these topics and create these, you know, hypothesized stories for people to work through. Right. They liked the, the approach so much that we actually worked with people at, at Worldview Studios to create a whole design thinking workbook. So oh, for other people who want to run mm -hmm. similar design thinking type workshops, really get into these questions in a multi-stakeholder approach and, and get through them, mm -hmm. um, as well as you know, leverage the vignettes we made or create their own. All those things are, are available so people can, can replicate this process. Great. So we'll make sure to include links to that also on the, the um, show notes. So if anyone wants to dig in deeper, I'm, I'm curious about one piece of this that is probably related to both access and consent, maybe to all of these, which is having to educate people on genomics, right? So it's one thing to make genomics cheap and everyone can get their genome sequenced, but how much should we be kind of you know, expected to explain both the potential benefits and the pitfalls and frankly, the uncertainty? around sequencing one's genome. I mean, when the first genome was sequenced, uh, you know, back in, in 0103, we thought, or some people thought anyway, man, we're going to nail this. We've got a whole human genome sequence. We're going to understand disease, right? And it's really, really not that simple. <laughs> so on the one hand, like you want people to understand that this could be massively beneficial. You also need people to understand that it can be risky and ethically dicey, but you also don't want to overpromise what can be learned both for the good or bad. Yeah, this is something that we, we've talked about in several different contexts. And there are some interesting initiatives out there. Like I've seen some great, um, what are almost like comic books, but are educational mm -hmm. about genomes on mm -hmm. a very basic level. You know, on, on some level, though, as much as I would like people to know more about genomics, there's this quote that a teacher told me one time that is probably not true, but is apropos where he said um, <laughs> Descartes, Descartes was the last person to read all the books, you know, and right. even if that's, that's not true, it, it's just the case that there's, there's too much out there for yeah. everyone to know. And Everything. so I'm not sure how much we can expect people to know about genomics. And I think mm -hmm. that we have to be realistic about what is possible to expect everyone to know. Maybe some level of knowledge is necessary, but I think that triage is important to think about here because people are busy. They don't have time mm -hmm. to learn about the intricacies of genomic medicine. I think what's important and what we get into in the, the policy principles, and it's, it's policy principle number one under consent, which is, is the starting point, is, is comprehension that people um, need to understand to what it is they're consenting, to what they're giving right. their genomic data to. And that... You know, it doesn't have to be certainly like a, a PhD level of understanding, but um, they, they should, the, these forms should be written with clarity of language. They should be delivered in a way that, that people can, can understand them in their own language. And if they um, are not able to read the consent forms, have somebody read the consent form to them, provide educational information as, as appropriate. And Australia is doing some, some really nice work around this as well mm -hmm. and and have people have the opportunity to have a dialogue ask questions feedback what it is they understand and just make sure that you know they they know what it is they're consenting to and mm -hmm. those consent forms should also have some additional information about like how are we using your data so if you have consented to give us your data for what um right and and that's that's certainly in most forms um but also the idea of renotification, not assuming that everybody wants to be re-notified. And I think it, it also, this takes us into kind of that ethical space as to when is it appropriate to re-notify people? Are incidental findings appropriate if there's mm -hmm. an incident, if there's a finding, but there's no medical way to address it? Um, is that appropriate? Does, does the finding need to come with medical approaches? So I think these are, these are other things we start to, to get into. Mm -hmm. So it's more about, I don't know, I mean, I think of like anytime you get a prescription at the drugstore in the United States and it comes with that long, tiny folded piece of paper, there's the, the side for the doctors and there's the side for the patients. There, there's a way to make the critical mm -hmm. information understandable. <laughs> and, and I think we have a responsibility to do that. No, that makes a lot of sense. And probably also to 
talk about time scales, right? So, you know, a mm-hmm. lot of my work is we focus on thinking about sort of two pieces. One is the diagnostic piece where a patient could benefit quickly, right? If there's already a therapy and you just need to know if it's appropriate for their genomic composition. But if that genomic data is going to feed into an R&D program, it could be 20 years before it brings a drug to, you know, the next therapy to market or whatever it is, you know, and having, having someone waiting, waiting to benefit from the drug their genome contributed to, you know, it could be a long wait. Yeah. These are, these are really tough questions. They're really personal, personal. And I think we spend a lot of time thinking about these from a high level, but at the end of the day, we're talking about our genes, like the, the, the building blocks of who we are. They're immutable. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're fundamentally us. And that's a, <laughs> it's a, mm-hmm. a really, really unique and, and powerful thing. And so years ago, my, my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. My mom is, is fine um, now. But several years after her diagnosis, it was found that she had a, a gene mutation, like a, a glitch in her DNA. And I was told I should get a test to see if I have the same one. And I am very pro, you know, again, knowledge and information. And, and all of a sudden, I was confronted with this of, do I want to know? What does that mean for me? Do, mm-hmm. I, do I need, you know, more invasive tests every year? Is there a treatment? Is there something I can do with this information? So it wasn't just as simple as getting a test or, or not getting a test um, now that I was facing it. And I think, you know, the stories Cameron and I have, have heard from people about these, these are not simple for individuals. They, these tests, the information they can reveal can change people's society in, or sorry, status in society. They can Mm -hmm. impact uh, marriages that are arranged to happen. They can impact family relationships. They can raise issues related to land um, claims. There are all kinds of things that, Mm -hmm. that are tied to identity that people are grappling with whether or not that should be tied back to genetics. Uh, and it's really important that we always kind of think, what does this mean to a person in their life at the end of the day and, and constantly right. take it back to that level? I hope that yeah, made but, sense. But no, it does. <laughs> and, and the anecdote that really drove it home was, was what Cameron mentioned earlier with the Havasupai tribe and mm-hmm. how the analysis of their data actually struck at the core of their origin story. Like, their very concept yeah. of who they are as people absolutely could, could be threatened by certain ways of looking at the the data. You know, yeah. you could imagine you could imagine any number of claims to geography being threatened by doing ancestry in a certain way. Uh, that actually was one of the direct consequences was contention over land use rights because of this mm-hmm. huge disruption to their cultural story. Yeah, so. These are very real problems. These are, mm-hmm. they're not, we, we wrote these vignettes and then they quickly yeah. came true. <laughs> that was actually, that, that was in a vignette and then it, it, it was another one that came true. We, we made up um, this situation happen to a tribe in the, the Andes. When Cameron and I would, would <laughs> I think, be, be what at our like 12th hour in the office, we would start to get into these deep conversations around the, the relationship between genetics and identity. We don't have any materials on, but it's it's yeah. it's a rabbit hole that I, I think people I recommend going down. My father teaches Holocaust studies, and one of his regular courses mm-hmm. is called Nazi Medicine. Very cheerful material, and occasionally I'll go do sort of a guest lecture on eugenics or something like this from mm-hmm. you know the scientist perspective. And he asked me, you know, what do you think the Nazis would have done if they had genomic screening capacity? And I was on the spot, and I didn't have a good answer, and so my my way of deflecting that was to try to muster humor, which was to say they probably would have realized their leader was half Jewish, which, you know, but I, but I still think about his question. You know, I, I do, you know, when you want to take it to the extreme of what would have, what would bad actors do with this information? Yeah. I, I think it's, it's a really, really important question that we can't overlook. You know, one thing that got mentioned earlier was that if you want to, to have benefits go all the way down to the individual level, then right. you start valuing people based on their genome. Well, mm-hmm. you know, eugenic, eugenics is Greek for quite literally, you know, good inheritance. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so that um, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. yeah. And these issues are still very present. Uh, we didn't talk about it, but one of the other projects um, that 
we've been working on in the leapfrogging mm -hmm. portfolio is around uh, BRCA mutation testing in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And as the, the project kicked off, I mean, it, it, it gave me, it gave me a heartburn and sleepless nights to think about introducing genetic testing in a country and, and amidst a population that had been through genocide in the very, very recent past. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's incumbent upon everybody who's in this space to talk about what, what does, getting back to your, like, what does genetics mean? And, and not letting uh, misinformation go out and this, this be used in nefarious ways or be interpreted in <clears throat> incorrect and nefarious ways. I think we have a huge responsibility there. Yeah. We've exhausted the time that you've been so generous to give me, but let's let's try to end on an optimistic note. So I'd ask each of you to, of all of all the, of all the things that you've kind of brainstormed, what what do you see as being some of the real upside of this sort of wider spread and democratization of genomics technology in, in medicine around the world? You know, what what makes you hopeful that you've seen so far that you envision? I think that at the broadest level, the most universal level, the cost of genomic sequencing is still dropping more rapidly than even Moore's law. You know, it has truly been amazing what we've seen in the blip of the last 20 years since the Human Genome Project finished. And I really do think that we'll continue to see the price fall. And I think that there is real hope that these databases are going to become more diverse, mm -hmm. that genetic sequencing is going to be further democratized, and I think the possibilities really go in several directions that could be really positive once we can all have this information about ourselves and it becomes ubiquitous enough that we can apply tools like AI and machine learning to it. And I, I think there's a lot left out there that we just don't know yet and won't until this is something that we all have in our hands. Yeah, totally agree. I To take the opposite, I mean, Cameron gave a, a good broad level view, just to take a, a very, very narrow in my own world view. When I started talking about leapfrogging two and a half years ago, I got, I got a lot of strange looks. And just over the, the short course of time since then, this is a topic that I've seen a lot more activity around. People are, are attuned to the need for increased diversity in, in genetic testing. I'm getting I'm getting phone calls out of the blue now. It's going in reverse to mm -hmm. talk about how can um, the collection of genomic data be more ethical. How can benefit sharing be applied? How can um, participants be included more in the the design of studies? So I've seen a, a real shift into this space, and I that 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 gives me a lot of of hope and optimism. And I also think with that people hopefully are, are starting to think about healthcare more holistically, not just, you know, I think there was a, a past of um, infectious disease versus non-communicable disease. And I think now different groups that maybe haven't worked together before and also including, you know, in the healthcare space versus in the data space, I think I see more, more silos breaking down to, to come together and um, make things happen quickly. It's exciting and it is fast paced. Like you said, you know, something you imagine on a whiteboard comes true, not in five years, but in six months. I'm, I'm glad to learn that, that you two and, and your colleagues are working on these issues. I think that, you know, that kind of leadership and stewardship is important. Um, thank you both for taking some time to talk to us today. And, you know, if you've listened to this podcast and enjoyed what you've heard and have other questions, like I said, we'll have lots of links on the, uh, the show's um, website. And uh, I'm sure Alyssa or Cameron will be happy to get some fan mail and, and hear yeah. what you think. Absolutely. Thank you both. We'd love it. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Raphael. This has been episode 22 of Talking Precision Medicine. Please share it with your colleagues, leave a comment or a review, and stay tuned for the next one. Thanks for joining the conversation. 